my way to explore one of the most ancient and mysterious islands in the world, Malta. It was here that a prehistoric society built megalithic structures using massive blocks. These blocks were arranged into complex designs and are considered by scholars to be older than the Great Pyramid in Egypt. But after a period of 1,000 years, all activity on Malta stopped, and any trace of the people who built these incredible structures vanished. But why? There are stories that say Malta was once home to giants, and even a race of legendary one-eyed creatures known as Cyclops. Could these stories offer clues as to what really happened on the islands of Malta? And if so, could there also be a connection to ancient astronauts? My name is Giorgio Tsoukalos. I explore the world that exists between reality and speculation, the known and the unknown. What we've been taught by mainstream scholars is not the whole picture. But I'm convinced that every day we are one step closer to the truth. I've traveled almost 7,000 miles to a place that has puzzled archaeologists for more than a century. Lying just south of Sicily, in the middle of the Mediterranean Sea, the islands of Malta have been of strategic importance from the times of ancient Greece all the way through to the Second World War. This small and densely populated country covers only 122 square miles, but it is as rich with mystery as any place on Earth. The islands of Malta contain no less than seven megalithic structures, and quite possibly, they are the largest freestanding stones in the world. To this day, archaeologists struggle to explain how ancient people living on secluded islands were able to accomplish such incredible architectural feats. So I'm here to find out if there may be an explanation that the mainstream has not yet considered, one that possibly has a connection to giant one-eyed beings, the Cyclops. In the epic Greek poem, The Odyssey, written by Homer in the 8th century BC, the hero Odysseus encounters a cyclops named Polyphemus, a giant, one-eyed, human-like creature that, according to legend, was the son of Poseidon, the god of the seas. Now, while Homer never specified where the cyclops lived, there are some who believe that the giant monster and others of his kind might have actually dwelled right here, within Malta's megalithic structures. To begin my investigation, I went to examine Malta's famous so-called cart ruts, which some ancient astronaut theorists refer to as the Nazca Lines of Europe, because they are just as mysterious. There are over 100 sites on Malta that have these ruts or giant pairs of grooves in the rock. Like the ones here at St. George's Bay on Malta's southeast coast. The mainstream theory on how these strange markings were formed is that the wheels of heavily laden carts compressed the limestone over a long period of time. Now, for that theory to be true, the wheels of the carts would have had to be of identical size and width. And they would have had to follow the exact same path over and over and over, never deviating. Otherwise, they would not form such precise ruts. But quite frankly, I think such a notion is nonsense. On average, these cart ruts are about 1.4 meters wide which translates to about four feet and seven inches. So let's see how wide these are. So right here, 
These are a bit narrower. This is four feet and four inches. And from end to end, we're talking five feet and three inches. So it all depends how wide those tracks are. For example, right here, they're about three and a half inches, or actually three inches in this part. And then up here, and we have seven inches. So if it were just a cart, then one could surmise that the width is the same at all times. So how were these deep and precise grooves made? And why? Perhaps there is a link between these strange markings and the stories of giants here on Malta. But how the grooves were made is only part of the mystery because these cart ruts go straight into the Mediterranean. Archaeologists are puzzled by this because divers have to determine that these cart ruts go about 42 meters into the sea, which is about 46 yards. One area located on Malta's southwest coast has so many mysterious ruts, a visiting Englishman nicknamed it after the busy Clapham Junction railway station in London. Hi. How you doing? Not so bad. Not so All bad. right. To help me find some answers, I've arranged to meet with author Gordon Weston, who wrote a book about the so-called cart ruts in 2010. Gordon, here we are at Clapham Junction. So, you know, lay it on me. Tell me what you think. Well, it's got a, what do you got, a half a lifetime? Absolutely, <laughs> yes. Basically, you couldn't drive a cart down here. The cart would be wrecked. Early researchers looked at vehicles that would scrape away the rock because that's what it looks like has happened. There was three devices. The first one was a sledge, probably the oldest form of uh, human transport. But they found that the sledge immediately got stuck. So the two other devices have been looked at. Uh, one was a travoise uh, used by the Plains Indians to transport their teepees from camp to camp. The problem is the poles will be wider than these ruts when they touch the ground. The next device is called a slide car. It's a load platform with two runners on it. This fanciful and ridiculous idea, practical experiments and that have seen that it just doesn't work. Gordon and I shared several different theories about the origin and purpose of the ruts, ranging from tracks used in the transportation of megalithic stone blocks to irrigation drains. But ultimately, every single one of these theories is problematic. Science is useless for this problem. There is no methodology which can be applied scientifically to these ruts. There's no way a block could be carried by a vehicle at the time the temples were um, built. The first temple was built in 3500 BC. A wheeled vehicle only just come into existence then. It certainly wouldn't have been on Malta. Malta was still in the deep Neolithic at that point. The presence of these ruts all over Malta is truly inexplicable. And there is one other aspect I took note of at St. George's Bay that baffles me most of all. So in St. George's Bay, in a city called Bersabuja, there are a couple of ruts that go straight into the Mediterranean Sea. Um, they are famous, you're right. It is uh, interesting to see that ruts go into the sea. They also said to have come up on the other side of the bay, but it's now built over. So how do you explain it? More and more, I'm convinced that the people living on Malta were much more technologically advanced than most mainstream scholars believe. But who were they? And how were they connected to ancient stories about bizarre one-eyed giants? I'm beginning to believe that these islands have been the home of a highly sophisticated civilization. A civilization that may have actually included extraterrestrials. I'm in the village of Crendi, about to meet with Dr. Anthony Bonanno, a professor of archaeology and classical literature at the University of Malta. 
Dr. Bonanno is one of the foremost experts on Malta's megalithic temples, so I'm excited to have him help me with my investigation. Hopefully, he can bring me closer to finding out whether or not a legendary race of one-eyed giants known as the Cyclops actually existed here, and if there might even be an extraterrestrial connection. I wanted to ask you if anyone believes that those prehistoric temples might have been built by giants. Yes, there is this association, even in Maltese folklore tradition, between the giants and the temples. There is a legend that the Gigantia temples in Goda were built by a giantess, a giant woman. Really? Yes. How old do you think the megalithic structures are? We can speak in terms of a bracket, certainly between 3,600 BC and 2,500 BC. There have been claims uh, that they could be older. If what Dr. Bonanno suggests is correct, then these Maltese megaliths are at least 1,000 years older than the Great Pyramid of Giza. But after seeing Malta's mysterious ruts running straight into the sea, I believe they may date back even further. Perhaps I'll find more evidence at the first site Dr. Bonanno is taking me to, the temples of Manidra, located on the rugged and isolated south coast of Malta. This complex consists of three stone structures that are laid out in the pattern of a trefoil. That is to say, structures which have three interconnected circular chambers. Malta is a fairly small island, but the ratio of how many megalithic temples exist here on this island is astounding. So why such a small island and that many prehistoric megalithic temples? This is a question which we find difficult to, to answer. The concentration is normally um, attributable to some sort of internal rivalry, uh, which spurred on this mad idea of building one temple after another. A mad idea, I like that. You know, people have been possessed to build this. The people must have had a compelling reason to carry all these stones, to put them into place. Do you think this structure was built with anything astronomical in mind, with observing of the constellations. It has been confirmed that the entrance is actually uh, orientated towards the rising sun at the equinoxes. But you have also similar alignments in the solstices where the rays of the rising sun hit the edge of these blocks here. In his paper, Manidra, a calendar in stone, Maltese investigator Paul Mitalev concluded that Manidra was built around 10,200 BC. He came to this conclusion because, based on the tilt of the Earth at that point in time, on the morning of the summer solstice, a beam of light would have come through the main entrance of the Manidra temple and been cast directly on the center of an altar stone. The only way this could be achieved is if the monolith at Manidra was placed specifically and precisely with the end effect in mind. Now what fascinates me is the fact that megalithic structures can be found all over the world. And most were carefully constructed to align with the sun. In Macedonia, for example, there's an ancient site known as the Kokino Observatory, which features four stone thrones at the top of a mountain, positioned to track the solstices and equinoxes. In Machu Picchu, there is a stone temple with three trapezoidal windows, also positioned to align with the sun during the solstices and equinoxes. Legends say that by looking through them, the mind can connect with other realms. But perhaps the most fascinating connection of all can be found on the northwest coastline of France. Here, a collection of over 3,000 massive rocks, called the Karnak Stones, align with both the summer and winter solstices. 
But even more incredible are ancient legends that claim that the standing stones were actually placed there by giants. Just like the legends of giants we find in Malta. What are some of the biggest blocks that you're aware of that have once existed here? We have much larger stone. Uh, we have one particular one at, at Hajar Im, which is um, estimated to weigh about 20 tons. And we have a series of them uh, of the same order uh, up in Gigantia in Gozo. That's just mind boggling, really yes, amazing yes, stuff. Uh, between cart ruts that go into the sea and a megalithic temple that could date back more than 10,000 years, I'm beginning to see just how Malta could connect to stories about a race of one-eyed giants known as the Cyclops. But before I can draw any conclusions, I still need to gather more evidence. I'm exploring the tiny Mediterranean islands of Malta looking for evidence that the legendary Cyclops may have lived here thousands of years ago. As my search for clues continues, Dr. Bonanno is now taking me to the temple of Hajarim, which contains what is possibly the largest monolith on the island. What does Hajar Im actually oh, mean? Hajar means stones, and Im could either be the uh, worship uh, or else standing. So, stones of worship or standing stone. Like this one. There you are, yes. Check this out. This is huge. Yes, wow. uh, three meters high by six meters fifty wide and about another meter thick. That makes about 20 odd tons. Minimum. Minimum, yes. 20 tons is around 40,000 pounds. That's the combined weight of 16 mid-sized cars. I'm always fascinated by the fact that giant monoliths were erected by various ancient cultures all over the world. For example, you can find them at Stonehenge in England, Karahunj in southern Armenia, and even as far away as Easter Island. So you have to ask yourself how and why were so-called technologically primitive people erecting these enormous stone monoliths without the help of any large machinery? This is incredible. So this is one of the largest freestanding okay, stones. I mean, you know, when I yeah. see stuff like this, that's when I yeah, wonder, how, you know, how did they how carry it? How did they, they quarried it in this case? Yes, they must have quarried it. And then put it upright, yes. Yeah, I mean, so how do you think these stones were brought here? Yes, they must have been dragged on a, a spread of roller stones. While some mainstream archaeologists suggest that giant blocks of stone were moved from quarries to the temples with the use of carts, that ran along the so-called cart ruts, others claim that they were moved by placing them on the top of stone balls and hauling them across the countryside. But while it's true that a number of spherical stones have been found at Malta's megalithic temples, it still doesn't explain why such enormous stones were even used in the first place. You know, when I see this, I mean, it's just this massive rock but, you know, th th the weight, I just don't know if the spheres would have withstood the weight. 20 yes. tons yes. of... Yes. Because the spheres were, were made of limestone too, right? And the rough surface would explain why these spheres were of actually different sizes, mm -hmm. different mm -hmm. diameters. But we have but never still discovered... Still bringing it here and then just, you yes, know, heave it. heaving it up. That is another Incredible. one, yeah. It's yes, like just yes. this obelisk just standing there. It's about uh, more than 15 marble, feet, yeah. 16 feet uh, tall. Mm -hmm. I'm still in awe of the size and complexity of Hajar Im. I mean, a 17-foot tall monolith? How did supposedly primitive Stone Age people move something this enormous? Today, we would use the most advanced of heavy machinery. And so the idea that some other type of technology was used becomes very plausible. And the idea that these structures today are considered to be temples implies worship. Who did they worship? The gods. Well, in my opinion, 
that is when the questioning begins, because we have to then ask ourselves, who were these gods? So, there's something else I would like to show yeah? you. Right. Yeah. I'm excited to explore the interior of Hajarim, because there is something I've heard about within this structure that leads some ancient astronaut theorists to believe that this temple dates back much earlier than 3600 BC. If this proves to be true, it could fall in line with the evidence I've already discovered that could indicate a civilization existed on Malta as far back as 12,000 years ago. Right, uh, so beyond a long corridor, covered corridor, we open up into a uh, courtyard flanked by two apses, one on each side, and each apse is accessible through a porthole entrance. That's one, and on the opposite side, we have another one here, okay, with the usual rope holes, and it is in this place that the famous Venus of Malta, about that size, was discovered. So this is where it was discovered? Right, right. Okay. According to Dr. Bonanno, many mainstream scholars believe the Venus of Malta is approximately 5,000 years old. But I find that very hard to believe because this clay figurine bears a striking similarity to one I've seen that is much, much older. In 1908, almost 70 years after the Venus of Malta was discovered, a nearly identical statuette was found in Austria called the Venus of Willendorf. It bears uncanny similarities to the Venus of Malta in both subject matter and its exaggerated style. But what I also find truly incredible is that the Venus of Willendorf has been determined to be at least 25,000 years old. The implications of this are truly staggering because if the Venus of Malta is 25,000 years old, then that would suggest that the entire megalithic structure known as Hajarim could very likely also be from this same era. Now, while I've yet to find concrete proof that the Cyclops really existed here in Malta, I see more and more evidence that the incredible structures here are much older than what most mainstream scholars believe. But what exactly does this all mean? In 1902, a strange underground temple known as the Hypogeum of Halsefliani was discovered on Malta. The first archaeological investigations at the site turned up more than 7,000 skeletons. And according to a National Geographic magazine article from May 1920, many were found to be, and I quote, long-skulled. I hope that Mario Kasha an executive of Heritage Malta can help me find out where the skulls are now and if there could be a connection to strange legends of one-eyed giants. So tell me how this place is unique in the world. Even today, there are still a lot of questions to be answered. There's no writing at all in, in our prehistory and nothing to really give us a hint of, of what actually happened here. Gradually, we started to learn more of the site and what happened in these archaeological sites that we have here all over the island, spread out. There are over 33 other megalithic sites, but this is the only one ever found which is to be underground. It was a burial site from the amount of bones that were found here and also a place for worship. How many human remains were found here? We give a figure of about 7,000 human remains, but obviously it must have been much more because the estimate was given from just one area. The, most probably the, the idea was that these burial chambers were reused and reused, moving away the older bones and putting in fresh corpses. The idea that this was a burial ground and that multiple remains were found possibly in the thousands where have those remains ended up? I mean, where are they? Do you have any ideas? You've got the uh, Second World War. All these were moved out. 
It's a tragedy that more than 7,000 ancient skeletons were supposedly lost. But I have actually seen an old grainy photo of some of them, and they definitely appeared to have elongated skulls, similar to those found in ancient Egypt and as far away as Peru. Luckily, a few of the elongated skulls that were found in the hypogeum were sent to Malta's National Museum of Archaeology shortly after they were discovered. In 1907, they were put on display and caused a sensation. Many believe that they offered proof that the stories of giants inhabiting Malta were true. Some even speculated that the skulls were of extraterrestrial origin. I'm really stoked to go and check out the archaeology museum here in Valletta because who knows, maybe they will allow me to see those skulls. Oh, check this out. That's a model of the hypogeum. So you can see how vast of a complex it is with spiral staircases, the different levels, and all hewn out of the bedrock. I mean, how cool is this? It's interesting to come up with different ideas, but once you see the whole extent of it, some explanations all of a sudden don't make any sense. Very cool stuff. Are you Vanessa? Yes. Pleasure to meet you. How are you? Thank you very much for having me. You're welcome. This is great. The Archaeology Museum holds interesting artifacts from Malta's megalithic sites, including the remains of what looks like the statue of a giant female, and even an oversized cup. But today, I'm here to investigate the mysterious skulls. You know, I was just at the Hypogeum, and they actually recommended that I should come and talk to you about some skulls that have been found there. So, would you allow me to see those? Of course, I will show them to you in yeah. my office. Oh, that's fantastic, thank you. What an incredible privilege. When 11 skulls found in the hypogeum were examined in 1912, they were found to have significant differences from normal human skulls. These belong to the temple period, so we're speaking about 5,000 years ago. Mm -hmm. They were found 100 years ago. Looking at the difference of this skull and these here, it seems as if it's like an elongated shape, and there are certain cultures, for example, in ancient Egypt or in Peru, where you actually find these elongated skulls. In 1928, 300 elongated skulls were discovered in Paracas, Peru, and were estimated to be more than 3,000 years old. Now, mainstream archaeologists believe that elongated skulls were achieved by ancient people wrapping boards around the heads of infants shortly after birth to create an appearance of nobility. But ancient astronaut theorists have another interpretation, one that suggests that some of the skulls were an attempt to emulate or copy the so-called gods. As you can see, even from the inside, there's no sign of the middle suture. Right. Completely fused. That's fascinating. The bones of the human skull are joined together by sutures, joints formed by ossification. The sagittal suture connects the sides and roof of the cranium. This suture is open when a person is born and closes around the age of 35. But the hypogeum skull seems to not have a sagittal suture. But how and why? 
these skulls are referred to as the elongated skulls. Like you said, this one in particular especially seems to be longer, which is quite unusual. Mm -hmm. I mean, I know there's quite a lot of mystery about them. In fact, we've been accused many times of keeping them secret because they're the remains, the, the evidence. Yeah, why, why are these not on display? They aren't on display yet. Yet? Unfortunately, they haven't been studied yet. They were discovered about 100 years ago. That's the first thing you should study right here. So are there any plans of potentially doing any DNA testing on these to determine the origin and things like that? Unfortunately, these have been handled many times. And some of them, most particularly this one, if you look inside, it's filled with plaster of Paris. Unfortunately, this would make it highly contaminated. And it's not worth destroying such unique artifacts to get data which is, which is not reliable. Mm -hmm. Vanessa, this has been fascinating beyond words. So thank you very much. I appreciate it. And uh, if anything happens with these skulls, let me know. I'm okay, definitely thanks. curious to learn more. I can't believe I just saw those skulls. The fact that they've been discovered 100 years ago and they have not been further investigated blows my mind. I know this is speculative, I know that, but what if what we have there is an extraterrestrial skull? Because that missing suture is very strange. To gain more insight, I'm meeting with Professor Hubert Zeitlmeier, founder of the Malta Discovery Prehistory Research Foundation. Professor Zeitelmeier has been looking for proof of ancient alien contact on Malta for over two decades. He's taking me to the final stop of my investigation, the Temple of the Giants on the island of Gozo. You know, it's really cool to go to Gozo, but I wanted to show you these photos that I took of these weird skulls that apparently were found at the Hypogeum a hundred years ago. And here, this one is missing the main suture that goes across the ridge of the head. Congratulations. <laughs> it is incredible that you could see this. You are one of the few lucky ones. Normally, they are hidden for the public. I tried to make a DNA test, but I was unable to make the test because they hide it. Do you think that these things might be extraterrestrials, or do you think they're hybrids? They are hybrids, made half and half, but made by the extraterrestrials. So they are much older than 6,000 years. So how many years do you propose uh, we're talking here? I would say we talk about 160,000 years. Based on the strange shape of the skulls, Professor Zeitlmeier believes that they date back between 100 and 200,000 years ago to the time when the first Homo sapiens sapiens emerged. And it is also around this time that many ancient astronaut theorists have suggested that extraterrestrial beings first made contact with humans and altered the course of history. Now, although these skulls are clearly too small to belong to giants like the Cyclops, could they represent something even more profound? Could they be the actual skulls of ancient astronauts? It's all a very interesting investigation to me. If in the end it has something to do with giants or not, I know this. something happened. I mean, look at these stones over here. Professor Hubert Seitelmeier and I have arrived on the island of Gozo to explore the Temple of Gigantia. According to legend, Gigantia, or the Temple of the Giants, owes its magnificence and its name to the strength of a giantess named Sansuna. And apparently she carried the huge stone boulders on her shoulders while carrying her baby under her arm while building this structure right here. 
During my visit to the Temple of Hajar Im, Dr. Bonanno had explored the idea that limestone spheres may have been used to move the massive stones into position. But Professor Zeitlemaya has an alternative theory, one that I've never heard before. He believes that the stone balls were used to protect the temples in the event of earthquakes. So you think that these stone spheres were actually used in order to hold these blocks in place? Yes. Sometime in the floor, there are holes in the floor, and there are the bowls with the right size, and they are fit into the hole. Right. And then we have the half hole here, half hole here, and we put it together. On top of the stone, there are always holes too. Uh, then you put the balls into these holes and then you fit the cover stone. And there it fits. Okay, so it skips. This cannot fall down anymore. So the giants did mean with this type of construction, they made the building for attorney. But I think this is great. I mean, this would explain the idea of what these stones were or these spheres were used for. This actually is a very ingenious solution to a, uh, an enigma. Just as some modern skyscrapers are built on rolling bases to minimize the impact of earthquakes, Dr. Zeitlmeier believes that the top and bottom of each monolith was designed with a hole carved out containing a limestone sphere. This would allow the stones to slide and roll and not break apart when tremors shook the islands. So it's clear that they had the knowledge to build these structures. And then all of a sudden, not only did they stop to build in this megalithic style, but also it seems as if the knowledge was lost. In my opinion, the reason the knowledge was lost is the flood, 12,000 years ago. But after the flood, they did not have the technology anymore to move these big stone blocks. I'm blown away by what Professor Zeitlmeier just told me. And now I think I can finally make the connection I've been looking for between the islands of Malta and a race of one-eyed giants known as the Cyclops. During my visit to the Temple of Gigantia on Gozo, Professor Hubert Zeitlmeier proposed that the early inhabitants of Malta were wiped out by the Great Flood, the same flood that is described in the Old Testament. In my opinion, the reason the knowledge was lost is the flood, because all the intelligent people were killed. And I remember that you proposed that this flood or one of these cataclysms happened many thousands of years ago. So how long ago do you propose that was, perhaps? The sin flood had happened 12,000 years ago. So it is common known in natural sciences that the Ice Age did abruptly stop about 12 or 11,000 years ago. Mm -hmm. And this was the reason this culture stopped abruptly, immediately out. So all that what they did after the flood is very low in education and in level. And that is why we can see the different building styles because you have the megalithic blocks and then you have smaller stones like this where that is very odd because you can clearly see the different styles and while archaeology tries to tell us that the smaller stones were used first, in reality it was just the opposite, that the megalithic style was first and everything else that followed was smaller because we can see that in many structures in different parts of the world where at the bottom you have the megalithic blocks and then everything that came on top was smaller stones. It's true. Professor Zeitlmeier's theory confirms my idea that civilization existed on Malta more than 12,000 years ago, before the time of the so-called Great Flood. This would help explain why the cart ruts extended into the sea, because they would have been made at a time 
when the water levels around the world were lower. And according to most scientists, the water levels around the world were lower between 10,000 and 11,000 BC, just before the end of the last ice age. In the ancient Hebrew text known as the Book of Enoch, which a few Christian denominations included as part of the Bible, it is written that God created a great flood to wipe out a race of giants known as the Nephilim. These giants were said to be strange beings, the offspring of the rebellious or fallen angels mating with human women. Now, according to the ancient astronaut theory, what the Bible often refers to as angels are, in fact, flesh and blood extraterrestrials. I mean, this is, this is some really interesting information. I have to now digest it. So it's been a great honor to, to listen to you and to uh, hear about your ideas and theories because not too many people talk about what you talk about. So thank you very much. I appreciate it. So if ancient stories about the Cyclops living on Malta are true, and since there is evidence that suggests that there was a civilization on Malta more than 12,000 years ago, then it is possible that the Nephilim and the Cyclops could be one and the same and that they were a race of alien-human hybrids that inhabited the Earth before the time of the Great Flood. I think Malta still has many more incredible secrets to reveal and much to tell us about mankind's extraterrestrial origins. But in the meantime, I'm off once again in search of aliens.